Welcome, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Macular Regeneration Association series of seminars uh, regarding uh, issues related to macular degeneration and other eye related conditions. I'll tell you a little bit about macular degeneration. Uh, first of all, I founded this organization after learning that my mother had wet macular degeneration and lost her entire central vision in, in uh, both of her eyes. Uh, this was the, before the uh, shots and the anti-VEGF shots that a lot of you have heard about. And it was, there was very, very little that could be done to save her vision. About a year and a half ago, I, by chance, I uh, developed wet macular degeneration in one of my eyes. And because I knew what to look for, so to speak, I was able to catch it immediately and did not lose uh, any vision as a result. Of course, the, the old adage, you know, if you catch it early, uh, you could prevent uh, vision loss. So that's why it's important to stay on top of these things uh, listen to these educational seminars and, of course, regular visits to your eye care professionals. Uh, the Macro Generation Association is a charitable 501c3 nonprofit foundation, and we survive primarily on uh, ge generous donations from the public. Uh, I want to also thank uh, our sponsors uh, for these uh, webinars. Uh, Regeneron Pharmaceuticals and Novartis Pharmaceuticals and Notovision, who have helped support these undertakings. Uh, we have a very uh, uh, interesting speaker today, uh, Dr. Leo Sims, and I'll just tell you a little bit about him in a moment. Uh, he will be taking questions after his presentation, and those questions uh, you'll you'll see at the bottom. Uh, not where it says raise your hand, but where it says Q &A. and A, and he will he will follow those and answer those questions at the conclusion of his presentation. Uh, Dr. Sims uh, serves on the American Regeneration Association Medical Board and earned his degree in ophthalmology from Pennsylvania College of Optometry and completed his residency at the Eye Institute at Salish University. He currently holds an appointment as Professor Emeritus of Optometry and Vision Science at the University of Alabama in Birmingham. It's now my distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Sims uh, for his presentation on glaucoma and medical and macular degeneration. Dr. Sims. Larry, thank you very much. It's my pleasure to be here. I'm flattered to be part of the Macular Degeneration Association's Medical Board. And I wanna add my welcome, uh, good morning or good afternoon, depending on your time zone for uh, joining us today uh, to learn a little bit about glaucoma and age-related macular degeneration. Before we begin, I have some obligatory disclosures, uh, none of which should have any impact on today's content. I think it was the French philosopher René Descartes who said, if you want to communicate, you must first define your terms. So I think it's important for us to think about what is glaucoma and we can talk about some scientific definitions, we'll get into that. But um, like Larry, I have a very personal connection, a family connection with glaucoma. Uh, my mother, like Larry's macular degeneration connection, my mother was diagnosed at age 35. And I remember as a young child uh, going with her to some of her visits. She uh, was treated over the next uh, 55 years of her life. And despite all those treatments, uh, she lost vision throughout the course of her lifetime. So uh, the other thing that Larry mentioned is that early identification is absolutely crucial to just about any medical condition. Because once we can find out what 
the potential problem is, then solutions can, can be pursued. So as you think about what your definition of glaucoma is, let's take a look at what the uh, science behind open angle glaucoma is. And we're going to be talking primarily about primary open angle glau glaucoma because that's the one that's the most prevalent. Now, some of you may have heard about angle closure glaucoma or some of the other uh, secondary glaucomas, but it's important for us to recognize that the bulk of glaucomas are this uh, primary open angle glaucoma. And a couple key features here in the uh, definition as you read through it, it's uh, a progressive optic neuropathy that has characteristic changes to the optic nerve and nerve fiber layer. And as you look at the photograph on your left, what you see is an optic nerve, and then those little arrows are pointing to retinal nerve fiber layer defects. So the retinal nerve fiber layer is essentially a collection of communication channels that culminate at the optic nerve or the optic disc. And if you're a glaucoma patient, you're probably very familiar with the optic disc and maybe terms like retinal nerve fiber layer or cup to disc ratio. And just to put things into perspective, our eyes are about the size of a ping pong ball and the optic disc or the optic nerve here is about as big around as a pen clicker. In some cases, uh, it might be as big as a very small uh, pencil eraser. So to evaluate that, we can look at it stereoscopically, but there are some other means, and we'll talk about some of those when we look at a case that uh, might be useful for early diagnosis. The other part of the definition here uh, regards visual fields. And again, those of you who are under glaucoma care or are glaucoma suspects know that uh, you have to go through typically on an annual basis that arduous visual field test. And nobody likes that. In fact, one of my colleagues in uh, Portland, Oregon, decided to do a survey of his glaucoma patients. And he asked them among oh, a half a dozen or so routine tests that are done on glaucoma patients to, to rank, you know, which, which, which ones would you like to have done all the time? Which ones do you hate the most? That, that sort of thing. And visual fields far and away was the one that everybody just absolutely disdained and horrified having to, uh, to, to go in for. But intraocular pressure measurement was the easiest. And it turns out that that is very significant, but it, it's because it's the primary clinically measurable risk factor for open angle glaucoma. Now, unfortunately, elevated intraocular pressure, just like in many cases, elevated systemic blood pressure, doesn't really have any symptoms. So this is a measurement that has to be made by, by uh, someone at, at an eye care visit. Now, we can get a little more in, into the weeds here and talk about uh, some of the other tentacles that relate to glaucoma and talk about what the American Academy of Ophthalmology's current def definition is. But a couple of things that I've highlighted is the fact that intraocular pressure remains significant, but there may be other unknown factors that contribute to damage. And we're gonna to touch on those uh, a little bit later, but these all seem to have an endpoint of showing up a specific and characteristic uh, optic nerve atrophy. So we're going to look at uh, some examples of those and not to, not to get too clinical and don't, don't worry about the images and some of the numbers and things like that. None of that, I promise you, will be on the test. When we think about the diagnosis of glaucoma, there are a few things that we should look at critically and things that every clinician will have in the back of his mind or her mind as, as the examination proceeds. History clearly, uh, you, you heard mine, uh, family history and other risk factors, nearsightedness or myopia now uh, has emerged over about the last, I guess, decade or so as uh, one of the risk factors, you know, not measurable like, or, or measurable like intraocular pressure. There's a number that we can put to it. But sleep apnea syndrome over about the last uh, five years has also emerged as something very significant as 
kind of a, an intangible risk factor for glaucoma. So all things being equal and clinical findings not pointing in any direction, uh, a positive diagnosis of sleep apnea might, might put uh, things in, into perspective. And thin central cornea, uh, which is a measurement done uh, by an instrument called a pachymeter. We get a central corneal measurement in uh, microns. And that emerged about 20 years ago from the ocular hypertension treatment study, which you may have heard of, that was a powerful risk factor for conversion. If we look at the clinical side, uh, intraocular pressure clearly uh, number one, we saw that picture of the optic nerve. So we're going to look carefully at that in a number of different means, not, not only visually, but uh, digitally, where we would also measure nerve fiber layer thickness and patterns. And then the visual field testing, the subjective, or let's call that the performance side of, of, of things. So some of the instrumentation that uh, you might encounter in a glaucoma e evaluation includes intraocular pressure. So the patient would be here. Uh, here's the examiner. That would be my smiling face if I were facing you. And then this is the probe that lightly touches the cornea to determine intraocular pressure, much like a place kicker might uh, check the inflation of, of a football. We're going to uh, examine the inside of the eye stereoscopically, again, at the slit lamp instrument with the auxiliary lens here. This is an example of a visual field test. And then the instrument here, patient looks uh, somewhat similar in each of these settings, would be to evaluate digitally uh, what the optic nerve and retinal nerve fibers, uh, for retinal nerve fiber might, might look like. So we're going to gather information on what the ocular fundus looks like. We've got some different examples here of different presentations from that documentation, which is crucial to, uh, for, for sake of comparison. Once we get a baseline for a patient who might be a glaucoma suspect or have a certain set of risk factors, we're going to pursue that uh, very carefully with uh, things like the visual field instrument or other analyses as well as uh, perhaps asking the patient to perform home tonometry. And this will give us information, not just as a snapshot of the intraocular pressure that particular day in the, in the clinic, but uh, over the course of a day where fluctuations may uh, give us a little bit of a different clinical picture as to what the intraocular pressure behavior might, might be. So those are pretty much the basics of glaucoma diagnosis or the establishment of a baseline, and then how uh, progression might, might be assessed. But we should also take a look at some of the future directions in glaucoma. And you may hear from your uh, eye care provider things like uh, macular vessel density. So the density of capillaries in, inside the eye, and then how that relates to uh, some of the other findings that, that are being done, particularly the visual field. So using physical measurements as well as uh, subjective or performance measures uh, is kind of a two-pronged approach to assess an, an established baseline, but more importantly, to look at uh, trajectory of progression. And one of the emerging measures here uh, is going to be the use of artificial intelligence. So we're going to be seeing more and more about that, that kind of takes uh, a lot of the decision-making process and the thinking process out of the hands of the clinician and really makes it very, very consistent. So artificial intelligence, you're going to be seeing more and more about this with regard to diagnosis and management of glaucoma. Um, not necessarily uh, a great commercial penetration just yet. Uh, a lot of this is in the preliminary phases. So let's take a look at a case. And this is a gentleman who uh, haps to, happens to be my neighbor. And uh, just about three years ago, uh, we were standing around having a beer after playing golf. And he says to me, he says, Leo, he says, uh, you're an eye doctor, right? And he says, I've, I've got this um, blurry vision and maybe some vision loss superiorly in my left eye. And I said, well, you know, what you ought to do is uh, go, go get evaluated. And I want you to see one of, one of my colleagues. So it turns out that his visual acuity is 20-20. 
So that's good. I mean, he's going to pass every state driving test in, in, the, in, in the United States. But he has a little difference in how his pupil reacts. And don't, don't worry too much about what this designation is. But it tells us that there's an impulse, a, a difference in the impulses uh, from one eye to the other. And it was a little bit deficient on the left side. So that's what the left means. But his pressures here are 11 and 9. And if these don't mean anything to you, I'll put it in context. The range of intraocular pressure is typically between about 10 and 20. So he's at the lower end of the range. And if you remember, it's elevated intraocular pressure. That would be a red flag for glaucoma diagnosis. So my colleague diagnoses normal tension glaucoma, which is a subset of primary open angle glaucoma. And he started them on uh, some drops that you might be familiar with. The chemical name is, is latanoprost. It was originally marketed as Zalatan, and these drops are extraordinarily powerful in lowering intraocular pressure, bringing it under control, keeping it under control over 24 hours with just a single dose uh, once, once in the evening. But his case was so advanced that my colleague said, you know what, you might be a candidate for surgery, so I'm going to send you for consultation for a procedure called selective laser trabeculectomy. And again, don't, don't worry, that, that, that won't be on the test. But this is a procedure that might take the drops off the table and all the involvement of, of, of adherence to it and have a very great effect, again, on lowering intraocular pressure. So he was seen about a month later and the pupil is dilated here. So this view is a little brighter. The pupil is not dilated here. So a little dimmer view, but you can see that there is a great deal of what looks like white or atrophy in the very center of his uh, optic nerve there, which would suggest the picture of that characteristic optic atrophy of glaucoma. And these are his visual fields, the black, obviously is areas where he doesn't see well, and the whiter areas are areas where he does see better. So you can see that centrally, where we've got the intersection of the horizontal and vertical axes here, seems to be preserved. So as with many cases of glaucoma, very few symptoms, if, if any, until uh, later stages, and there's a demonstrable uh, difference in visual performance as is uh, reflected here. This is an example of one of those uh, digital evaluations for um, optic nerve uh, fiber and optic disc. And the left eye is on the bottom. The red would suggest that there is uh, a very significant thinning inferiorly in that uh, nerve fiber layer corresponding with his visual field loss. Not so much in the fellow eye, again, corresponding with his visual field loss. So these are data that your uh, eye care professional would collect to evaluate, not only from a performance standpoint or an observational standpoint, but what do we have in terms of some very careful numbers? You can see there are a lot of uh, digitizations here that will allow us from this point as a baseline to follow trajectory and determine whether treatment is in fact, excuse me, uh, successful. I mentioned earlier that vascularity is one of the uh, early hallmarks of glaucomatous damage. And while none of these might be meaningful to you, this is a, an angiogram, an OCT angiogram, that if you look at the density of capillarities, the, the grayness here between these white lines of the larger arterioles and venules, you can see that it looks very, very uniform here but there, there are some gaps down here. And that's where we have loss of capillary perfusion, which might be a, a significant early sign in glaucoma diagnosis. Again, not instrumentation that has a great penetration into all clinical practices, but something that in the future will be very, very useful. And this is just his fellow eye uh, reflecting a somewhat similar, but to a greater extent, you can see that some of the areas here of darkness uh, are much more widespread than we saw in the, in the fellow eye. 
So I hope you've uh, all put your questions in for, uh, for, for glaucoma there. And remember that we've got some very significant risk factors. We've got some things that beyond just measuring intraocular pressure and looking at the optic nerve, but looking at some factors like sleep apnea, which might be uh, changed by medication or might be altered by diet or, or exercise, there are some kind of intangible risk factors. So let's turn our attention now to age-related macular degeneration and ask a similar question here. And that is what is age-related macular degeneration? And on the right side of the panel there, you see that I've put the uh, title of one of my favorite photography books, Chasing the Light, uh, in some different uh, contrasts there and in some different font sizes. And with age-related macular degeneration, what I see is that my patients are chasing the light. It takes more and more light as we get older to see the same things, but with age-related macular degeneration patients, that trajectory is really accelerated. So if you look at the bottom uh, title there, you can see that the contrast, contrast is not great, but the font is a little bit larger than is the one above it, than is, above that, than is the one above that. So what we have with age-related macular degeneration in very early stages is a loss of contrast, more difficulty with uh, vision in dim situations. And we can really pivot from that in terms of a performance measure to some things that, that we see clinically and correlate those very nicely. So let's take a look at uh, what, what might be uh, a definition again of age-related macular degeneration. It's a degenerative retinal condition that can cause central visual, vision loss and visual in impairment. What is significant about it epidemiologically is that it's the leading cause of severe vision loss in people over the age of 50. And that threshold of 50 degrees or 50 years is often employed because in the age-related eye disease study, the AREDS, again, which you may have heard of if you're an AREDS, uh, if you're an, an AMD patient, that was the minimum age for, for in inclusion. Now, what you see on the right is a cross-section, what will be maybe a histological uh, representation of uh, the, the retina there. And what we're looking at centrally here are photoreceptors. So those are our rods and cones, and just about everybody is familiar with those. But beneath that is the retinal pigment epithelium. And it seems like that histological studies are pointing to the retinal pigment epithelium as deteriorating or uh, atrophying as an early precursor before photoreceptors are, are involved in age-related macular de degeneration. So we're not going to dwell too much on that, but take a little bit of a look at a couple of examples of age-related macular degeneration. So earlier we saw the optic nerve, and we said that that was about the size of a pen clicker or a small uh, pencil eraser. The fine lines here are the retinal vessels, and those vessels, uh, some of them that we can see here, the finer ones, are about as fine as a, as a human hair. And you can see some disruptions to the uniform background here that are these little yellow dots, and those are drusen. And again, that's a term that you may have uh, heard if you're an AMD patient. And what we're looking at here is the cluster of those around the very center of vision, which is the macula, hence age-related macular degeneration. And what we're looking at in the uh, superior panel there is an example of dry or non-neovascular uh, AMD. And this is by far the more, more prevalent of the two types. Larry mentioned that his mother and, and he both uh, suffer from the wet form. And the wet form affects a smaller proportion of patients, but it is responsible for the majority of vision loss. And you don't have to be a clinician or trained in, in ophthalmics to appreciate that there is considerable disruption of any uniformity of the back of this eye with the wet age-related macular degeneration. These islands of red here uh, represent the hemorrhaging that is taking place 
which corresponds with the designation of wet, hence, hence the uh, hemorrhagic uh, presentation there. Just like with glaucoma, we know that there are uh, really a, a table of risk factors here, some of which are non-modifiable. We all get old at the same rate too fast. Nothing we can do about our genes and we cannot, uh, about our gender and we cannot run our, our genes. But there is some progress being made with regard to identifying patients who are at highest risk via genetics and maybe starting to screen those patients earlier. Maybe not putting a threshold at 50 years, but maybe dropping that down to 40 or even 30 as risk factors add, add up. Let's take a look at the ones that might be modifiable. And we're going to take a little closer look at these and some, some specifics about them. At the top of the list, I always put smoking. Uh, my father was a smoker and to his credit, uh, he discouraged his firstborn from smoking. Uh, it was the cause of his death. He had em emphysema. But we know that smoking affects uh, not only the, the macula, but also potentially oxygenation at the optic nerve. So maybe we can include that as a risk factor for glaucoma as well. There's some tentative evidence uh, emerging about that. It should probably be no surprise that if there's a vascular component to age-related macular degeneration, that cardiovascular disease plays a role. And that's sometimes impacted by uh, dietary intakes. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. Alcohol intake, uh, I'm not going to talk about. There's some information from the... Um, um, for, from a study that's uh, taking place in Wisconsin that perhaps moderate drinking is not a risk factor. So when my patients say, say to me, doc, okay, you want me to stop smoking? Do I have to stop drinking too? Uh, maybe we can say, okay, let's just put the brakes on, but not, not necessarily come to a full stop. And something that is cumulative over a lifetime is our environmental light exposure. So being out in, in the sunlight and we'll talk a little bit about the uh, relationship between nutrition and a clinical measure uh, called macular pigment optical density. We're not going to get too far into the weeds uh, on that. Some of you may recognize this scene. This is the uh, Golden Triangle of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. On the left here is the Allegheny River. On the right here is the Monongahela River. And your speaker today, I was born about eight miles upstream here in a little steel town called Braddock, Pennsylvania. And uh, growing up, a six pack and a bag of potato chips was um, a seven course meal. So uh, maybe I'm not the poster child to uh, be, be talking about nutrition with, with that background, but it really becomes significant and something that uh, we've taken to counseling our patients about much more carefully over the last uh, couple of, of decades. So when we look at lifestyle profile, we have to ask our patients uh, a number of things. And this is kind of a self quiz for you out there in, in the audience. What, what about your diet? Uh, how many drinks do you have over the course of, uh, of a week? What sort of activities are you doing physically to stay active? And most significantly, how well do you think you see? Have you given up things because you don't see well? So we can again fold in another of the risk factors that, that we saw for glaucoma, and that is family history. That seems to be uh, very significant. When we think about uh, practical management for dry age-related macular degeneration, there are some inter interventions that are based on those modifiable risk factors that can slow the, the, the progression. So what we're trying to do is keep that boulder from rolling down the hill too, too quickly. So we've talked about smoking set cessation. We're gonna talk a little bit more about diet and exercise. We'll get into some specifics on nutritional supplementation because my patients expect that once they've been diagnosed with age-related macular degeneration, I'm going to be able to recommend or prescribe a supplement that's going to undo 60 years of bad, bad habits that may have led to some systemic disease like cardiovascular dis disorders. And then talk about what, what we can do with regard to that uh, cumulative effect of environmental light protection. So number one, smoking cessation. And some of these numbers here really highlight the fact 
that there is uh, an, an unappreciated awareness of smoking's effect on age-related macular degeneration, but it's the number one modifiable risk factors. And if you look at some of these statistics here, current smokers are at a much, much greater risk for developing age-related macular degeneration than um, non-smokers. 90% of patients with AMD were not advised to stop smoking. Like I said, very personal connection for me. So that's high on my list. And half of smokers did not know that smoking could contribute to blindness, visual impairment, or, or loss of, of vision. So lack of awareness, very, very significant there and something that uh, certainly can be turned around. What about dietary and lifestyle modifications? You've probably heard about the Mediterranean diet. And a couple of studies recently have highlighted the fact that the Mediterranean diet is very significantly associated not only with uh, longevity, but also with um, lower risk of age-related macular de de degeneration. So the high-fat diet is something that we should, as practitioners, probably advise against. And then in, in not only the negatives, but also including some uh, positive behaviors or positive habits here uh, to perhaps replace some of those high fat choices that, that we will talk about uh, a, a little more. We can go back in history and Hippocrates uh, in medicine is probably um, best known for his um, number one precept, which is first, first do no harm. But uh, he had some other um, quotations that might be, be very useful. And one of them is, let food be thy medicine, and medicine be thy food. So I think it's very significant when we look at the relationship between diet and age-related macular degeneration, and as we're seeing more and more of the relationship between uh, diet and glaucoma, that uh, this is something that's, that's been known for uh, centuries, if not millennia. One of the uh, points of guidance here is something that's available from the uh, United States Department of Agriculture and its dietary guidelines for Americans. Uh, the eighth edition is 2015 to 2020, um, but there is an updated one for older patients that is very specific that can be found uh, at the uh, USDA uh, website. You don't need this uh, spe specific URL. If you get to the um, Department of Agriculture, you'll, you'll be able to sort through and see what some of their recommendations are specifically with regard to reducing fat, reducing sugar, uh, and increasing fiber and uh, things like green leafy vegetables and, and fruits in, in the diet. And this is one of the things that um, might make things simpler in terms of a take home message. You can see that the uh, plate here is divided into some uh, different segments here. And we want vegetables and grains to be a greater proportion than protein and, and, and fruits. But you can see that there aren't a lot of uh, uh, fatty components here, perhaps some buried within the protein and then dairy in its um, own kind of orbit out out there. But just to support this notion of the Mediterranean diet being, being useful, there is a three continent consortium called the I-RISK consortium. And it's comprised of investigations here in the United States, in Australia, as well as Europe, where prevalence of age-related macular degeneration is relatively similar and higher than uh, elsewhere in, in, the, in the world. And the um, risk factors here have been consolidated and some of the uh, recommendations with regard to supplementation have, uh, have come from this. And one of these uh, is the Mediterranean diet, which as you can see from this uh, statistic here, reduced uh, incident advanced age-related macular degeneration by about 41%. So again, not only our uh, US Department of Agriculture, but uh, the International Coalition here that has uh, looked at the Mediterranean diet and its relationship to age-related macular degeneration. One of the things that um, kind of goes along with that is physical activity. And down at the bottom here, and I apologize for, for the overlap, I think I've got two, uh, two of the same things here. 
But if you can kind of read, read between the lines here, the bottom line is that inactivity is bad for us. So sitting is the new smoking. And I think this is a quote from uh, a study that came out of Australia uh, a few years ago, but physical activity seems to have a, a protective uh, effect. And I'll mention one other thing. I saw a local news item uh, the other day, and it was uh, about a gentleman who had parachuted into Normandy on, on D-Day back in 1944. And he was celebrating his 100th birthday just, just a couple of days ago. And they showed a picture of him with, with a, uh, a guide jumping out of a plane on his 100th birthday to celebrate his 100th birthday. And I thought, wow, that's, that's pretty significant. So they had an interview with him and they asked him, they said, what is it? What's, what's the secret to your being able to uh, stand and jump out of a plane at, at age 100? And he, he said two words, keep moving. So physical activity, very, very significant. So this um, mantra here of 150 minutes of physical activity a week might seem insurmountable at first, but you, you can break it down. That's 30 minutes uh, over five days over the course of a week. And you get two days off. So we should go from screen time here to physical activity, showing basketball uh, backboard here kind of as the opposition to the, to, to the screen. And maybe it's something that we should do at this point. I'll get up, walk around, take, take a little break because we've been uh, at it here for about 40 minutes or, or, or so. So smoking, um, lifestyle, dietary, et cetera, kind of brings us to what might be substituted for some of those, or probably a better word, supplementation or, or adjunctive. And the acronym here is the Age-Related Eye Disease Study. This is a study that, that was started many years ago and took a look at patients 50 years of age and older, all of whom had um, moderate to advanced age-related macular degeneration. And they were given four different groups of, well, three different groups of supplements. One group was um, a, a, a placebo. And the bottom line is that certain antioxidants and vitamins, along with the mineral zinc, reduced the progression of age-related macular degeneration by about 25%. So that became very significant. And maybe you've had a recommendation or you've been to the pharmacy and you've seen that there are AREDS formulations that, that are available. So this is really a landmark study that demonstrated the benefits of nutritional supplementation for patients who had moderate to advanced age-related macular degeneration. So that was one study that was done in the United States, but there are a couple of other studies. There was a follow-up to the original AREDS and they took a look uh, at a couple of tweaks in the formulation and specifically some of the uh, carotenoids, a uh, term you might, might be familiar with that might be best, most, most beneficial. The uh, Rotterdam study is part of that I-RISC consortium, the three continent study that takes a look at age-related macular degeneration. And then uh, from the Tufts New England Medical Center, uh, some of you may get their, their bulletins, but their, uh, their, their research and their distillation of the literature uh, is really very, very significant in that it takes a look at a lot of volume of literature and takes kind of the best of everything uh, to give us some very specific guidelines. So those guidelines look like this, and I'll, I'll take a moment to um, dwell on some of these so that if you're taking notes, you can take a look at uh, some specifics for you, but there are a couple of carotenoids in here. And carotenoids um, kind of sound like carrots. And all of our mothers told us carrots are good for our eyes. And it's the carotenoid component in carrots that include things like lutein, zeaxanthin, and another of the carotenoids uh, that, that you might see available if you look carefully at the ingredients on, on some supplements, mesozeaxanthin. Our antioxidants are represented here as vitamin C, E, and D3. And you can see that there are some different designations here with regard to dosage. International units 
versus milligrams. So uh, be careful to take a look at what, what different doses are. And then finally, zinc. And there's a lot of controversy surrounding the dosage of zinc. The lower limit here of 20 milligrams is probably sufficient uh, with regard to a recommended daily al allowance, but some formulations may contain up to as much as 80, 80 milligrams of, of zinc. So variability throughout these, including how much lutein, uh, personally, the lutein that I take is toward the higher side, the 10 milligrams, and I take uh, a supplement that includes at least 500 milligrams of vitamin C, um, some vitamin E, some, some vitamin D, and then uh, my particular uh, supplement formulation or dosage uh, is toward the lower end of zinc. So that brings us to the omega-3s, and the omega-3 fatty acids were one of the components of the AREDS-2 study, but they fell out as not demonstrating a, a significant positive effect on slowing the progression of age-related macular degeneration. However, there is, there is some other evidence uh, from other studies that omega-3s alone would be beneficial, and the recommended dosing is in the neighborhood of uh, 1,000 milligrams a day, of fish oil for those not eating fish. So we can get a lot of these components in our daily intake simply from dietary in intake, looking at that very, very carefully. The body does not uh, synthesize lutein and, and zeaxanthin. So we have to be eating carotenoid containing vegetables like kale, like, like carrots uh, in order to, to get that. But supplementation might be easy, especially for patients who might be dietarily de deficient. So kind of a menu there, kind of a guideline or a protocol uh, to suggest what uh, some of these studies over the course of years have come up with in terms of recommendations and, and guidelines. So that brings us to our fourth point, and that is uh, systemic disease management. We talked earlier about cardiovascular disease, and that's kind of sometimes tied with obesity. So when we look at these and their connection with age-related macular degeneration, management of these complications, whether it be uh, obesity, cardiovascular disease, or a, a combination, seems to show up in the eye in terms of the appearance of drusen and other um, atherosclerotic man manifestations. So those parallels there are very significant. So if we can reduce the burden of age-related macular degeneration by minimizing the impact of systemic disease, then we're going to be far ahead with regard to the progression of age-related macular degeneration. A couple of other uh, corollaries with uh, age-related macular degeneration from systemic disorders are diabetes and high cholesterol. Uh, Diabetes, because it's a vasculopathy, is going to have an impact on the abundance or the um, density of circulation in age-related macular degeneration. So maintaining good, good vascularity, which we can now measure with some of those angiographic instruments, is going to be very, very helpful there. And then, of course, uh, maintaining low, low cholesterol levels. Uh, to a limit um, that is recommended by your uh, PCP. So the high lipoprotein levels here, again, are uh, associated with age-related macular degeneration development and something that we should be aware of, not only because of recommendations from the Department of Agriculture, but from these uh, scientific studies that are well-designed and look very, very carefully at things like um, High, high lipid levels. So we can make some healthy shifts here and it might be a little bit difficult to see in this panel on, on the left, but think about substituting nutrient dense snacks for high calorie snacks. Look at those labels carefully. Uh, replace fruit with uh, fruit products that have added sugars. One of the first things I look at on a label is what do we have with regard to sugar? Number two is going to be uh, sodium. 
Think about replacing refined grains with whole grains. I mentioned uh, sodium, if we can keep sodium to, to, to a minimum, whether you look at it with regard to percentage or uh, milligrams of, of sodium, oils to replace uh, saturated fats. Personally, it's very difficult for me to give up uh, butter. And then um, I probably have not had a canned carbonated soda in the last 10 years. And one of the reasons is that my wife has some recommendations that, that, that we'll take a look at earlier that might be uh, very useful in kind of a reader's digest sense as to what's, uh, what's good and what's uh, not so good for you. So some simple dietary changes that uh, are, are very similar to, to what we just took, took a look at. Eat one extra serving or fruits of vegetables every day, pass on the salt shaker, consume a healthy breakfast, limit your intake of sugar sweetened beverages and make heart healthy food swaps as we just saw some specifics. But a couple of quotations here that I've taken from the uh, literature recently, sugar is the new tobacco. And I think that's, that's very significant. Um, tobacco is addicting, sugar might be thought of as, as addicting as well. And this comes from um, a, a professor who is an order of the British Empire, a very high honor given to uh, citizens of, of Great Britain, who is at Oxford. And then uh, a little earlier quotation came from an interventional cardiologist by the name of Asim Malhotra in, in London. Sugar is the greatest threat to our healthcare system. So very significant, sugar seems to have replaced uh, some of the saturated fats when we thought, oh my gosh, saturated fats are terrible for our diet and everybody's gonna die of cardiovascular disease. So in order to make foods palatable, sugar be became the substitute. And this is something that uh, I wanna take a little bit of time with because uh, it comes from one of my uh, former colleagues in Alabama, Thomas Morrow, uh, Dr. Thomas Morrow, who is a, uh, a, a family practice physician, and he treats a lot of patients with diabetes, and I practiced in Alabama, and Alabama is very high in the uh, diabetes belt, if, if you will, and he has some recommendations that go something like this. If it's refined, comes in a box, is white think white bread, except for cauliflower, comes with a pop top, think canned soda, contains high amounts of omega-6, doesn't require at least a few minutes to prepare, don't eat it. Now, one of the things some of my uh, patients with, with diabetes had come to adopt was the whiter the bread, the sooner you're dead. So when you think about what's listed here, we're talking about refined products. We're talking about processed foods. We're talking about white breads. We're talking about high sugars. So these are things that typically don't require any preparation. And it makes it easy to just, you know, grab a soda off, off the shelf rather than maybe taking the time to uh, prepare something. And then the final of our five pronged uh, approach here is retinal light protection. And one of the things that we need to think about is that most of our environmental outdoor exposure comes early in, in life. So the ball game's over by age 21, 25 or so, some say as, few, as low as 18, because we spend most of our time indoors after that. So we're at a computer screen, we're working at a desk, we're seeing patients in a, in a bunker. And this, the, the significance of this is that this, um, Environmental life exposure to, um, or the, the environmental light exposure is cumulative. So when we do take that two week vacation or we do spend the weekend out, outdoors, sun protection is very, very important. We can make the analogy to what we would put on our skin in terms of protection against um, malignant melanoma, for example. So those, those sorts of things um, are really very parallel in terms of protective effects. So what about monitoring progression and de detecting change? But um, before we go there, 
I, I want to mention something that I neglected because I thought I had the slide. And that is uh, three things that my wife has said to me. She said, I don't want you eating anything that any food that is advertised on television, anything that you can get from a drive through And let's see, what's the third one? Advertised on television can get through a drive through I don't have the picture, so, so I can't show you. But those, those are three exclusions that, that she had. And I said to her, I said, well, well what, is, what does that lead? And she says, wine and certain chocolates. So while that kind of limits thing, and bless her heart, she, she is the beneficiary, but she wants to take good, good care of me. So if you just think about the uh, two that I remembered, not the third that I can't remember, the two that I mentioned, um, what's served through a drive through highly processed, a lot of sodium, probably high sugars in those sodas. And what's advertised on, on television, those are things that, that we can avoid very easily. Now, those of you who are age-related macular degeneration patients are probably familiar with the Amsler grid. Um, it's about 75 years old. It was in introduced by Mark Amsler of Switzerland. And the idea is for this test to be administered um, one eye at a time. So as a patient, you're asked to, to look at this very center dot and then determine whether there is any distortion of this very regular gr gr grid pattern uh, in the periphery. So staring at that center dot, you can do this as you, as you look at the screen uh, with each eye separately to see if there is any distortion uh, of those lines, any uh, irregularity to the uniformity of boxes that, that those lines uh, describe. But it turns out that the Amsler grid has uh, really become in, insufficient. And there are some things that really have displaced it in terms of better, better ways to determine early changes in age-related macular degeneration. And one of those is simply based on what we started talking about with regard to AMD, and that is difficulty seeing in poor light, needing more light uh, to, to see. So there's a commercial instrument available that will uh, do that, will measure dark adap adaptation and give us an idea of some of the very earliest stages of age-related macular degeneration. So Amsler grid had its, its place and it was, it, it, it was very good. It's kind of rudimentary, but it's really been kind of uh, supplanted by the fact that uh, we have uh, better, better means to, to, to do that. So today, um, I hope you're convinced that beyond the impact of individual patients, age-related macular degeneration can be a very significant burden on healthcare resources. One of the things that Larry mentioned was the in injections. The injections are very burdensome from a financial standpoint, but also on, on the patient. Uh, if you are a patient receiving anti-VEGF injections, you know that there is a regularity to, to the schedule. And that, that can be very troublesome with regard to being able to meet those expectations with regard to uh, regularity. We know how to identify AMD early and perhaps uh, titrate that, that trajectory and take a look at recommendations that we can adopt with regard to modifiable risk factors uh, for our patients, not only taking away certain behaviors such as dietary changes or smoking behavior, but the positives like retinal light protection and supplementation. So we can monitor AMD um, progression or trajectory by uh, an instrument called the ADAPT-DX, and then once the diagnosis has been established, we can look to our um, 4C, uh, the no tall vision in instrument to chart the progression or look at the trajectory of both dry and wet AMD and identify patients who become candidates for um, additional treatment. So we've gone through um, kind of a quick synopsis of glaucoma. Uh, a little more time spent with regard to age-related macular degeneration. So I'm going to take a look at our question and answers 
uh, session here. One of the first questions here was about in, in, intraocular pressure and is there pain involved? Uh, is, is that a, a, a symptom if uh, there's pain involved with, with IOP? Um, how, how, how am I going to know it? And really, it's the measurement of, of intraocular pressure, and the number kind of becomes a, a keystone, and everybody dwells on it. Every time my, my mother went for, uh, for, for, for a visit, she would come back and tell me what her pressure was and what the doctor said about the pressure, and it, it really became uh, almost burdensome. Um, to, to know what that number was. And we place so much emphasis on that number that uh, it, it, it becomes almost overwhelming. But it's not so much the number that's, that's important, but what's the consistency of that value? And at whatever value your, your particular pressure is, is it staying steady? Is it something that your eye care professional is happy with? If based on your pressure, whether it's 12 or whether it's 18, whether it's 10, whether it's 20, and the 10 to 20 is about the normal range, the uh, average is about 16 if we measured everybody in the world, is, is your particular case stable and stationary at that pressure? So that's, that's to me, the, the, the greater significance of age-related macular degeneration. And some of the other questions involve the uh, relationship between uh, glaucoma and age-related macular degeneration. And we discussed them today as uh, two, two different entities. And in some sense, they, they are separate, uh, but they, they do have some, some commonalities. And one of them is the fact that there may be dietary or lifestyle influences on both. And we don't really know how many patients, for example, have both age-related macular degeneration and glaucoma. I know I saw perhaps 10% of patients uh, in that particular category uh, in, my, in my clinical practice. And it's not necessarily uh, more common if you have glaucoma that you will develop AMD or, or vice versa. But what we should recognize is that uh, the older we, we get, the more likely we are to have complications of that, that involve vascular changes. So whether that's the vasculopathy of diabetes or the relationship to glaucoma or age-related macular de 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 degeneration, there is that um, decreased vascular component that kind of, excuse me, underlies all of these. So when, when, when we think about enhancing vascularity, um, moving around, exercise, think of that 100-year-old who on his 100th birthday jumped out of a plane, okay, keep moving. Uh, there was a gentleman at, at, at my gym who was also uh, one of the participants in D-Day, and he was, uh, he was a big deal every, every year. He passed away this year, un unfortunately, but he was in his 90s, and one day somebody in the gym was, was, was asking, I said, Mike, what's your, what's your secret? You know, you, 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 you look good. You've been around for a long time. And he said, well, he said, you see me here at the gym, right? He said, I eat a lot of salads and I get a lot of sleep. So when you think about lifestyle, those are, those are the kinds of things that, that are going to uh, keep us healthy. And while, okay, pressure is going to get out of control and maybe we can drop the pressure with, 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 with drops, some of these tangential things are going to be very helpful. But in patients where the drops don't control uh, the, the uh, intraocular pressure, there, um, there, there, there is a surgical alternative, a number of surgical alternatives. And I can tell you, my, my mother was a textbook for all the treatments for, for glaucoma. Uh, she passed away about 12 years ago, but the surgical techniques in that intervening decade or so uh, have really, really become honed to a much, much greater de degree. And the surgical procedures now are much simpler, they're much more long lasting, uh, and they are much more effective in um, controlling the, the pressure and maintaining uh, visual performance. Glaucoma probably is uh, hereditary, so that's a checkbox on my uh, 
list of risk factors. Uh, so far, so, so good. And in terms of um, glaucoma and losing uh, peripheral vision and restoration, a number of years ago, there were some stem cell studies, and we didn't get into this. There were some stem cell studies that were very promising uh, with regard to restoration of um, visual performance, but those uh, were mouse studies. And it really hasn't made the transition to primates or to the, the human realm yet. So there is some promise and that's, that's probably pretty far away. So we're probably looking at another uh, decade or two before, um, before stem cells really have any uh, impact on restoration of vision for, for humans. There's a question here. Um, I have a client whose doctor told her that everyone will get AMD if they live long enough. Is that true? Well, age-related macular degeneration starts with age-related. So um, will everyone get AMD if, if you live long enough? I suppose that's a, a potential extrapolation, but I don't know that anybody's ever, ever looked at that. And I think what we need to think about is if we maintain a healthy lifestyle, then we're probably going to minimize the chances of that. So doing those positive things is probably something that's going to minimize the uh, absolute outcome of, of that uh, statement. So here's another question. Um, my mother had glaucoma and my dad had macular degeneration. Will I develop these diseases? It's, it's tough to say. Uh, whether you will, but knowing that, knowing that that, that you have the have have those risk factors, then uh, certainly doing the things that you can to minimize the, the those risk factors is going to keep you in in better shape. Another question: If you have both AMD and glaucoma, um, is it the more common type dry and dry AMD and higher IOP? I don't, I don't know that anybody's uh, ever done uh, anything with regard to looking at, at that. And here's a question from a patient uh, specifically. I'm in my early 40s and was just diagnosed with dry AMD in both eyes, drusen in one, but not in, in the other. Is there a genetic test that could tell me the likelihood of how fast my AMD will ad advance? There's probably no genetic test that will tell you uh, about trajectory. The genetic tests that are available will tell you about the likelihood um, of you uh, having it and the severity of it. And then potentially what um, supplements might, might be most beneficial. So I would, I would certainly query whoever uh, is taking care of you uh, to look, look at the uh, genetic tests that, that are available. And then uh, I think we've answered this question, but I think it's worth, worth emphasizing. Can diet help glaucoma and macular degeneration? And we have certainly seen that, um, and there are a number of studies that, that point to exercise being beneficial for, for glaucoma as well as macular de degeneration, and also um, dietary modifications and lifestyle modifications in, in that regard. So an absolute uh, yes answer to, to that. Is there any special glasses that I should be using with, with glaucoma? Well, you just wanna maximize your central vision. So seeing the refractive, ref refractive uh, recommendation from your um, eye care provider there would, 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 would be the best. And then I have macular degeneration and have lost some of the central vision. Now I have glaucoma, which affects the peripheral vision. Can I save my vision? Well, <clears throat> certainly number one, following any recommendation with regard to uh, the, the glaucoma treatment, uh, maintaining the intraocular pressure, which will uh, minimize progression of, of your glaucoma. And then <clears throat> with regard to macular degeneration, again, following uh, recommendations that are specific for, for your case, but also think, thinking about some of those uh, general recommendations that we went over, like smoking cessation, um, 
physical activity, diet, and lifestyle modifications, and those positive aspects to um, keep you keep you on the uh, right track. So I think that uh, takes care of just about everything with the exception of what, what percentage of patients have both AMD and glaucoma. If I were to hazard a guess, it would probably be in the neighborhood of 